Um, we're going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about transportation and technology. Technology, of course, is no stranger to Seattle with the many amazing tech companies here. Um, I'd also like to thank Zipcar for sponsoring the breakfast this morning um, and say that after the session we're about to do with Rit Agarwala, the, um, uh, the speech with uh, Rick, uh, Rit Agarwala, we're going to be having a, a special conversation about transportation and technology um, this morning. I invite all of you to come to that as well. Um, also, NACTO Camp, of course, will be going on. We have a lot of really amazing ideas that came out in the last couple of days, and people voted on them, and we have an amazing program coming up for NACTO Camp, so please um, uh, check that out as well. Um, so next up, we have Rit Agarwal as our morning keynote. Um, Rit is a chief policy officer with Sidewalk Labs. Um, and he's a major thinker and strategist on city sustainability and in transportation in particular. Ritz has been a leader in this area for quite a while. Um, he put together the uh, famous Plan YC under Mayor Michael Bloomberg um, in, the, in the early 2000s, um, which led to, among other things, uh, Jeanette Sada Khan uh, being the commissioner of New York City um, for transportation, as well as many of the, um, the improvements which have led to, I believe, a 19% decrease in CO2 production in uh, New York City since 2005. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to bring up Arit Agarwala to tell us a little about his um, current work and his past work. Thank you very much. I'm honored and, and grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, here at NACTO. Um, to a certain extent, this is very much, for me, a bit of a homecoming because Although I haven't officially been a transportation official, I started my career at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, and it was really transportation that led me into urbanism, which is really the way I think about my expertise. I've been a big city government official. I've studied urban history. I've taught urban policy. Uh, Linda didn't mention I helped Mayor Bloomberg transform the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Coalition. I've done a great deal of international work with mayors. And so as an urbanist, it's kind of surprising pretty much every day that I find myself part of a technology firm, Sidewalk Labs. Our mission at Sidewalk is to develop technology that makes urban life better. And if you had asked me how that would happen five or 10 years ago, I might have pointed to Easy Pass or maybe the need that the New York City Department of City Planning finally had to get Outlook. My thinking has evolved a bit, um, and part of it is through my colleagues at Flow, which is our company that some of you are aware of, working on making urban transportation more effective and more data-driven. But the boundaries are still difficult to cross. Our CEO, Dan Doktoroff, likes to point out that the key problem with urban technology to date is that urbanists and technologists don't speak the same language. So when I walk into my office every morning, I feel a bit like a stranger in a strange land. I look a bit like this. <laughs> and sometimes the gaps are amusing. Um, at one point, someone assumed that I was coming here to Seattle to speak to NACTO, which clearly must be the National Association of Chief Technology Officers. And the high point of this last year and a half at the firm has been when one of my colleagues who comes from the technology sector took me aside, very seriously told me that after working several months on urban technology, he had come to a real big conclusion. He had figured something out. He says, Rit, I've had the insight. Changing cities is hard. It turns out he had thought that until now we just hadn't bothered. <laughs> but I am learning to speak technology, slowly, but learning. And of course, we're all learning to speak technology because it's increasingly clear that technology will change the cities of the future. Some of it is near term, how to deal with TNCs, how to make parking more intelligent, how to use technology to make fare collection more efficient. But Many of the questions are even more profound. Will autonomous vehicles lead to supercommuting or massive sprawl? Or will they enable ride sharing and help the city? Could robotic construction make housing more affordable? Will virtual reality make cities unnecessary? And what will all this digital technology do to the fabric of urban life? So I thought I'd share with you the results of an exercise we did recently to think through how technology might affect cities. 
and what that demands from us and what that demands of you. We tried to understand cities from first principles, focusing on essentials rather than on existing practice. That helped us get away from history, from existing technology and other things that we should not assume are permanent. It helped us avoid the problem of trusting in personal preferences or current tastes as if they were eternal. And what we arrived at was the realization, when you strip everything else away, that urbanism is basically density. The presence of people living and working together in close proximity. That's obvious. But what it helped us clarify was the fact that what makes cities more or less attractive over time is whether density is attractive, which is to say whether the efficiencies gained by density outweigh the costs created by density. Call it, if you will, the trade-off between good friction and bad friction. We found three key efficiencies. Density enables much lower consumption of resources and time. Density enables higher asset utilization. And density entails frequent physical interactions. There were three key costs to density. A reliance on central systems. The fact that density increases the need for courtesy and trust among people. And that it requires coordination and negotiation. Looking at density this way as the balance between its core efficiencies and its core costs helps us understand how density has succeeded and failed over the last century and a half. The greatest era of urbanization in American history was between the 1880s and 1920s. And it was an era of great and increasing efficiencies to density, driven largely by new technology, streetcars, electricity, sewer systems. And asset utilization was of prime importance because these were expensive investments. They could only be built where lots and lots of people would use them. The middle of the 20th century saw the opposite trend. Resources were cheap, the telephone enabled business to disperse, the automobile reduced the marginal cost of, tra of travel, at least as it was felt by the individual, and federal investments in infrastructure made asset utilization much less important. And at the same time, good things, civil rights, more effective democracy, environmental standards, increased coordination costs in cities, and the frictions grew and the efficiencies declined, and Americans moved to the suburbs. And I'd argue that the American urban renaissance of the last 20 years has seen a similar set of changes. And the internet and technology played a significant contributing role, reducing the hassle of utility shopping, increasing the importance of the creative ec economy that relies on physical interactions, especially unplanned interactions among workers, like you see here in Seattle's technology neighborhoods. And so then what might technology do to and for cities over the next generation or two? Of course, we can't know for sure, but our guesses go like this. Overall, technology promises radically to reduce the efficiencies of density. Vehicle autonomy will reduce travel times and congestion, making the shorter distances of urban areas less important. And even though I've worked on urban climate change policy for more than a decade, I've become convinced that solar roofs, small-scale battery storage, and electric, electric vehicles will soon make it more possible for suburbs to become carbon neutral than big cities, which cannot generate as much clean energy on site. Technology will make it easier to utilize assets even in low-density areas. Less than a decade ago, really reliable on-demand taxis, of course, were only available in a handful of downtown cities across this country. Now Uber and its peers have made that a technology that extends virtually, or a service that extends virtually everywhere. And we will expect to see more and more assets like that susceptible to that kind of change. And finally, we can assume that virtual reality and related technologies will reduce, although of course never eliminate, the need for physical interactions among people. I think she might be on a conference call. <laughs> but it's not all bad news for density, because technology also holds the promise of dramatically reducing the bad frictions of urban life. With big data, computer intelligence, and location tracking, we can imagine central systems that are far more efficient and offer far greater performance than they do today. It should be the case that transit becomes better and cheaper, that central utilities decline in cost, 
and that we find ways to centralize and share new things, ranging from power tools to dining rooms that don't travel across the distances of exurbia. We also expect that technology can help increase trust and courtesy. We know that data and computer vision enable huge leaps in security. We can also imagine things like using noise monitors to enforce nuisance ordinances, perhaps even to cancel out noise, thereby reducing the number of complaints people have about their neighbors. And of course, we know the power of online reputation as a way to ensure good behavior among people who don't know each other. Jeb Bush isn't the only one who drives for Uber. And we know that technology can help reduce coordination costs. Online voting should enable more frequent consultations that reach a broader constituency than the people who traditionally attend public hearings. And technology should enable us to negotiate space much more effectively. If we can move to a world of shared autonomous vehicles, we can virtually eliminate parking problems, which, as you know, are the prime barrier to neighborhood acceptance of greater density. Taken together, it seems that technology will worth, work both to reduce the advantages of density and to reduce the costs of density. So the key question is which changes first and which changes faster. If density loses its advantages faster than cities become easier to live in, people will increasingly seek less dense neighborhoods. If the reverse happens, we'll continue to see an urban renaissance. In short, I think we are in a race, a race to ensure that technology actually makes cities more attractive. And if I think about the dynamics of this race, I fear that cities start off with a handicap. Because most of the things that technology can do to neutralize the benefits of density are things that consumers will likely choose to adopt on their own. Virtual reality goggles, autonomous vehicles, household solar power, these are consumer purchase decisions. The private sector, and especially the world of startups, is perfectly designed to find and sell solutions like those. And that means that density will lose its advantages at the rate of consumer adoption and private sector innovation. And that is very fast. And it means that if all you do in your transportation agencies and in your city halls is open the doors to ideas that come in from the private sector, you will find a lot of solutions that are easily adopted. And those will make your cities better, but they will also make the suburbs better, and they will make the exurbs better. And over time, we will get more sprawl. But the things that make urban life easier are things like having central systems incorporate technology, tackling the very real challenges of balancing privacy and security in public spaces, and developing new tech-enabled approaches to public consultation. These are problems that require a willingness to tackle difficult issues, to engage with an inclusive set of stakeholders, to drive change through institutions beset by misaligned incentives and outdated thinking. And above all else, they require the willingness to deal with the unintended consequences and negative side effects of changes that are mostly good, but not without cost. These are not problems that the private sector will naturally solve on its own. These are problems that you must drive the private sector to solve. So I want to leave you with two requests. One is to tell the world what you want. The USDOT Smart Cities Challenge did a great service by getting so many cities to sit down and think about what they want from technology. And I can't say enough positive things about NACTO's AV policy brief. It is exactly the right approach to get far ahead of the technology. And I want to thank the many of you who have responded so positively to the work that T4A is doing on connected streets, work that we at Sidewalk Labs are proud to support. And I know Russ and, and James are here somewhere. And I want to congratulate Salita Reynolds on LA's urban mobility in, in a digital age report, which sets a clear, smart, and courageous agenda. I've already told my colleagues that I think it should be the product roadmap for our transportation company, Flow. But I hope you at NACTO will go even further. Because, of course, you know that no one city is big enough to force the world's technology companies to work within each city's rules or to meet each city's needs. 
but all of you working together can in fact define how technology gets applied and where it gets applied and what it does in your city. So my first request is to be very clear and very explicit about what you want. Lead the way, and I think the market will follow. But my second request is this. Get ready to do it. Implementing technology is going to be the next transportation revolution. And you are going to have to do it with all of the urgency that you brought to the revolution that created the complete street. There is a great risk that if you ask the technology world for a solution, they will show up with it and then die on the vine waiting for it to get implemented or watch as it gets tied up in the politics or in the internal power struggle or the interagency confusion. And the problem with that scenario is not just that one project gets delayed. The problem is that each delay will reinforce the tendency of so many people in technology to believe that end running government is the only way to make change. And if that tendency gets reinforced, it will slow down the progress of those technologies that benefit density without slowing down the progress of those technologies that uh, help density, or I'm sorry, that undermine density. So ultimately, it's not too far off to think that you really have to be chief technology officers. And we really are all going to have to learn to speak technology. And it's not because the technology world has figured out the future and we need to catch up. It's because you need to be able to teach the world of technology how to speak urbanism. Because ultimately, we are in a race. It's a race to make cities win the age of digital technology. It's a race we can't afford to lose, and it's a race that nobody can win but you. Thank you.